All right, Jim, you want to do a little guess the program before we get out of here? Sure, why not? I got my pen right here. I got a folder here of programs from my collection that have not been filed away yet, so they are here. And I am there, and you are there, and we You're are one. You're a big filer, aren't you? I am a big filer. I have more file cabinets being added to the file cabinet collection. I just, I just whip my sh out and let it hang out everywhere. All right, Jim, this first program... I have to open it up to get to the first match. The opening bout, one fall to a finish. Wayne Martin versus Frankie Hart. Okay. I have to turn. I have to turn again. What the fuck? Turn again. The this is one of those programs with a lot of advertising in it. There's advertising, but also there's articles. Semi-final event, a tag team match. Sailors Dick Trout and Bobby Nelson. Oh, good Lord. Versus Angelo Savaldi and Frankie Hill Murdoch. Oh, Jesus. And the main event, best two out of three falls for a championship I will not name. The champion, Leroy McGurk versus George Wagner. Okay. Um... Obviously, Wayne Martin and Frankie Hart would probably not be the the match that would suddenly make me aware of this. Um, nor would the tag team of Dick Trout and Bob Nelson. However, Angelo Savoldi and Frankie Hill Murdoch being together, of course, Frankie Hill Murdoch was the father of Dick Murdoch. And then Leroy McGurk being in the main event against George Wagner, who was gorgeous George, but he would not have been billed as George Wagner after he had become Gorgeous George. And so one would think that this would be the central states or perhaps the southwestern states. Frankie Hill Murdoch was from Texas, but McGurk's main claim to fame as a promoter was Oklahoma and, and uh, Missouri, but this was when he was an active wrestler before that was even involved. So... I got to think, I'm working this out. It's got to be the late 40s to mid to late 40s. And it's probably in Texas because McGurk would not have just been sticking. Was McGurk, it's for a title. I can't remember when he first won a recognized world junior heavyweight title. But I'm going to say we're in Texas in 1946. The date, September 21st, 1945. Gah! No, but you're close. That's very good. The Stockyards Coliseum. Oklahoma Stockyard Coliseum. Was that a World Junior Heavyweight title match? It was. World okay. Junior Heavyweight Championship. And actually, one of the cool things about this program is whoever went, because I got a whole bunch of these from uh, different shows, they wrote notes. Oh. So on the cover, it says, only Mother and Me went to this one. <laughs> Wayne Martin versus Frankie Hart. Wayne Martin was the fairest. Frankie Hart was fair but rough. And it says he won, he lost. Uh, Wayne Martin won, Frankie Hart lost. And then the tag match, Sailors Dick Trout and Bobby Nelson. Fair, really, Wonderful, fair, one. And by the way, in in this usage, fair means they were the clean wrestlers. They were they wrestled fair. And then under Angelo Savaldi, it says cheat Italian. Yeah. And under Frankie Hill Murdoch, it says fossil stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, uh, gorgeous. Goddamn! Wait a minute. Hold on now. <laughs> Murdoch wouldn't have been that old then because Dick was born in like fucking 1943 or four, I believe. Was he not? No, Dick, Dick wasn't born until he was 50 when he passed away. So he wasn't born until 46. So Dick was born that same year. How old could his father have been? 30, 35. All right. Are you on mute? Yeah, I was looking up Frankie Hill Murdoch. Uh, was born 1909. Oh, my God. That would have made him 37. So there 37. we go. 37. 
That was a fossil to some wrestling fans back then. But let me. What uh, were the comments on McGurk and Wagner? McGurk won fair. George Wagner lost cheat, and then it says, and I could be wrong. Prime picker or prune picker? Prune picker. A <laughs> prune picker. That's the insult there. He's a <laughs> prune pricker. <laughs> He's a no good prune picker. Well, let me just pick up one of these other ones and see if it has any of these uh, insults here in, in this one, too. Judo Jack Terry's dirty. Dandy Dizzy Davis is fair. Stinks unfair. Hey, yeah, we, Diz, Dizzy Davis, by the way, uh, who Gorgeous George stole a lot of the gimmick from, right? That's what's always been said. They, yeah. they were both Houston boys. All right, I'm ruffling through these programs here. I apologize. This next one, Jim, a very interesting one. The opening bout, Mark Lewin versus Martin Angelo. Martino Angelo or Martin Angelo? It says Martin. Carl Von Hess versus Gregory Jark. Or Jarque. I'm not sure exactly the spelling. He's from Spain. Q-U-E. Q-U-E. Four famous midgets, Tiny Roe and Cowboy Bradley against Ivan the Terrible and Pee Wee James. Bolo Hakawa versus Roy Shires. Ludwig von Krupp versus Mr. Puerto Rico. In a tag team match, one hour time limit, two out of three falls, Luis Martinez and Eugenio Marin versus Wild Man Fargo and Don Stevens. Ooh. Pete Manigoff versus Skull Murphy. Ricky Starr versus Jesus. Jerry Graham. And finally, the main event, two out of three falls to a finish. Antonino Rocca and Miguel Perez versus Larry Hamilton and Joe Hamilton. Okay, and that would be Madison Square Garden. And uh, let me go down the card first. Um, obviously, Mark Lewin, everybody knows. Martino Angelo, uh, a journeyman who ended up uh, affiliated with the Beast as a manager in the 60s, right? Uh, was that Kurt or Carl Von Hess? Carl Von Hess. Carl Von Hess, um, famous German of the period. Ludwig von Krupp, was that not Boris Malenko? Or we, no, he was Otto von Krupp. Who was Ludwig? Because it wasn't Killer Karl Krupp. I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Puerto Rico, I'm not sure either. Luis Martinez and Eugenio <laughs> Marin uh, against Fargo and Stevens. Obviously, Don Stevens was Don Fargo. They got their name... They became a brother team when they teamed up in the New York Territory. Because at first, Jackie had been going as Wild Man Fargo, and Don had been brothers with Ray Stevens. Pete Manigoff was Bobby Manigoff's son, the pioneer champion. Skull Murphy, obviously, was Skull Murphy. Ricky Starr, the ballet dancer, and Dr. Jerry Graham. We've covered Jerry's exploits. But Rocca and Perez against the Hamilton brothers, this was... The match where Jody main became the youngest guy ever to main event Madison Square Garden, correct? That is correct. And the, the year on that is going to be because of Fargo and Stevens having different names. I think it's 1957 in Madison Square Garden. The date, Saturday, May 24th, 1958. God damn it! The Wonder Boys of the Mat. This is the unusual story of how two outstanding wrestlers became world tag team champions. It all happened in the year 1956, in Miami, Florida, when Fargo and Stevens found themselves face-to-face -face in the ring as opponents for the first time. Wrestling with no time limit, the match was finally halted by officials. It seemed each man knew the other one's every move, and after realizing one could never beat the other, they decided, as a team, they would be champions. This came true by defeating the World Tag Team Champions in St. Louis on January 19th, 
1957. Did that happen? No. <laughs> the likeness of these... Every, everything happened because they met Jack Pfeffer and because he reminded they reminded him of Buddy Rogers. The likeness of these blonde wonders is amazing. Not only their tactics, but their size, appearance, personalities, and most of all, their long hair. Both boys weigh in at 200... I think Pfeffer wrote this. Both boys weigh in at two... Both boys. Yeah, he did write this. Yeah. Both boys weigh in at 227 pounds, and both boys have tattoos. The only difference between them is that Fargo hails from Charlotte, North Carolina, and Stevens from Santa Monica, California. <laughs> you will always recognize this team for the most thrilling, fabulous actions, and this makes them the world champions. Fabulous. Fabulous. How about that in the last sentence? Well, and Pfeffer wrote that. And by the way, Stevens was really, or Don Stevens, Don Fargo was really from Pittsburgh, and Jackie was from North Carolina. Um, now I've got to go back and look because I thought they were the Fargo, they were Fargo and Stevens when they first went to New York. Then they were the Fargo brothers in Tennessee, but I believe that predates this. So they may have gone back to New York now that I look at it and use the names that they'd used before, before they finished that up and became the Fargo brothers full time. So I was six months off. Okay. Let me ask you this one. This next card, Jim, the first bout listed is a match. It doesn't say if it's a championship match. Tony, Mr. USA Atlas and Rocky Johnson versus Adrian Adonis and Dick Murdoch. Yep. Superfly Jimmy Snuka versus Mr. Fuji. Big John Stud versus Ivan Putsky. Andre the Giant. Versus Dr. D, David Schultz, Hulk Hogan, versus the mass superstar, and finally, the main event, an 18-man over-the-top rope battle royal, $30,000 to the winner. The contestants include Hulk Hogan, Andre the Giant, Ivan Putzky, Jimmy Superfly Snuka, Tony Mr. USA Atlas. Rocky Johnson. Everybody on the card. <laughs> Tiger Chung Lee. Oh. Mill Moscaris. The Mass Superstar. Dr. D. David Schultz. Big John Studd. Mr. Fuji. Adrian Adonis. Dick Murdoch. The Samoan. And Paul Orndorff. Okay, well, obviously, it's a WWF show. And... The question is, is it, um, it would probably be 1984, but it could overlap potentially into late 83, but not by much. I don't know that it would be early 85. And... <sighs> It's almost impossible to say the city because they did these cards everywhere uh, at that time across the country. Would this have been an early foray into St. Louis or in the Northeast because of Moscaris or St. Louis because of maybe television? I don't know. Well, you did a good job with this one. Friday, February 10th, 1984. Okay. The Keel Auditorium, St. Louis, Missouri. Aha! There you go. What do you think of this? Two months. Well, not two months. I mean, they kind of went there, I guess, at the end of 83. But yeah, two months. February 84, WWF in St. Louis. The wrestling war is heating up. This is the card they present. Well, they had... Uh, I, was this a house show, or do you think... Was this a taping? It was a house show because they advertised the entire lineup. But I believe they taped, because I think I've seen this Battle Royal on one of their commercial tapes. Yeah, they may have done something like that. And that's, again, I can't see the wisdom of putting, of booking Mil Moscaris in St. Louis unless it was going to be taped. Because who would give a shit? To be honest, I mean, you know, Mil Moscaris, was that the only time he ever worked St. Louis in his life? I'm not sure. 
I don't remember him on St. Louis shows. I don't remember too many masked wrestlers on St. Louis shows. Yeah, and 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 for the WWF even afterwards. So the point is, they did something for television or video that night, and the card they've got Andre, they've got Hogan, they've got Snuka, they've got Adonis and Murdoch, they've got all the names, but they're it's not like you know the WrestleMania card because they they were trying to go and run regularly there. So they wouldn't that that's probably why they put the battle Royal in on top. Just have a feature attraction where they weren't burning up their, you know, main matches. Cause these are not exactly program matches necessarily, except for Atlas and Johnson, Adonis and Murdoch. The practice of using cameras in any manner is an infringement of copyright material and is absolutely <laughs> prohibited. How about I that? wonder if that went for Linda Rufa, too. Well, let's uh, go to the next program here. Jim, this one. The first bout listed is Jim Nance versus Ron Romano. The second bout, Edward Carp excuse me, Eduardo Carpentier. Yeah, yeah, don't forget the last O. Well, different programs, different things. Versus Mr. X. It does say there will be one more great bout. Argentina Rocca versus the Mongol. Hmm. Crusher Lasowski versus Johnny Powers. Ah. And the main event of this program, the card, the Parade of Champions, Gene Kaniski versus Hans Schmidt. Okay. You're just trying to fuck me all around, aren't you? Uh, I get the idea, obviously, from Johnny Powers, one would think Cleveland, Buffalo, sub up, you know, that end of New York. Lasowski worked in in the early 60s in Pittsburgh and the Northeast, some without actually working for Vince Sr. all that much. Um, Kaniski's, this would be before he was the NWA champion, obviously. And he worked a lot for Vern in the Midwest and uh, obviously Canada. Hans Schmidt was an international star, but would have been probably on the downhill slide of his career now if this is indeed in the early 60s, uh, Carpentier against Mr. X. Carpentier would have already been a big star, but just used on this to beat Mr. X and be an attraction. What the fuck is Argentina Rocca doing here? And which Mongol? Was it El Mongol? Phil Mercado? Was it... Who knows what Mongol it might have been? Uh, Guido Mongol. Um which would then again put it in that Cleveland-Buffalo area. Or it could be Ontario of some description, and it's just a star-studded card. God damn it. Um, it's between Buffalo and Cleveland in 1963. The date, April 6th, the Saturday, 1968. What? The Memorial Auditorium at the foot of Main Street, Buffalo, New York. What the fuck is Rocca doing there in 1968? Bobby Bruns makes his promotional debut with the presentation of the 18th Annual Parade of Champions Saturday night, April 6th at the Memorial Auditorium. So it's so he... Go ahead. He was running opposition to Martinez. Well, I don't know about that, because it says Bobby Or was Bruns Martinez running yet? Makes his promotional debut, and then it says here, Bobby Bruns, the most successful wrestling promoter in the world, <laughs> has taken over the wrestling reins from Pedro Martinez, a pillar of the mat game in Buffalo, for the last 20 years. The energetic Bobby Bruns knows wrestling from A to Z. He developed a tremendous amount of interest in the wrestling game when a young man, and today has blossomed into the world's most respected promoter. 
Let me just stop for a second. Has anyone ever called Bobby Bruds the greatest promoter, the most respected promoter, the best promoter? I've never heard that. Bobby Bruns? Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to, he didn't, Pedro Martinez is, was still around after this. The NWF, Powers, and fucking the whole nine yards, did they pull some kind of switch where they sold it to him? He ran it to ground and they bought it back? Well, here's another thing. Here's another article. It says, information, Bobby Bruns, the world's greatest promoter and matchmaker, <laughs> is the world's greatest listener and critic of his own shows. He's extending an offer to all the greatest wrestling fans in the world meaning the Buffalo fans, to call him, wire him, write him, or get in touch with him in any way about his wrestling promotions. Tell him of your likes and dislikes. He's open to suggestions at all times. Don't forget, the world's greatest promoter and matchmaker wants very much to hear from you. He'll be a familiar figure in the city of Buffalo. Stop him on Main Street or in a <laughs> Buffalo restaurant and talk to him about wrestling. You'll find he's a good listener and a very interesting man. Call him at 854-6171 or write to the Erie Wrestling Club, 234 Main Street, Buffalo, New York, 14202. Was Buffalo that small a town back then? You could just find the guy at pretty much any time you wanted to walking down the street? How about Jim Nance on this show, too? The football player. Oh, I, did, I had no idea who the fuck that was. Oh, the next wrestling date, Friday, April 19th, the great footballer Ernie Ladd, six foot nine inch, 315 pounds from Kansas City Chiefs will appear. So we got to find out what happened to Bobby Bruns and Martinez took the territory back over. Well, hold on. I have another program. This one is from later in that year, October 25th. Yeah, this one too. Bob, promoter Bobby Bruns presents. The Gallagher brothers are back. Memorial Auditorium, Friday, October 25th, 8.30 p.m. Who's on that card? See, that's real yeah, quick. Yeah, that's the interesting thing is who's on this card, plus other matches, obviously. Masked Marvel versus Don Lewin. I think Don Lewin may have been a local at that point too. Yes. Little and, Beaver. And, and had probably been retired for quite some time. Little Beaver and Cowboy Bradley versus Little Brutus and Billy the Kid. Hans Schmidt versus Gino Angelo. And the main event, Oof. Mike and Doc Gallagher versus Argentina Rocca and Johnny oh. Powers. Wow. See, this is a forgotten chapter in that area's wrestling history because Bobby Bruns, obviously, with Crusher Lasowski, he was nowhere near the Northeast in 1968. Hans Schmidt was, his career was winding down early 70s. He'd be retired. He was a major star in the early 50s with network TV. Kaniski, especially Rocca, Carpentier, friends of Bobby Bruns's. That, I, mean, I don't, I didn't know that Rocca was wrestling in upstate New York in 1968. So it appeared, and the Gallaghers, who were from 10 years before. Bobby Bruns's old friends were coming in to work for him as he was trying to make Buffalo a go. And with that last card, boy, it doesn't appear to be working out. And Powers was there because, you know, he was there and he was going to end up owning part of the office. And Don Lewin had been retired for years at that point. By the way, ticket prices, $150, $2, $250, and $3, all seats reserved. But I guess... Another point, because you can't see this, the front cover, the top of it mirrors the St. Louis program, the wrestling logo that other companies used also. That Bobby Bruns would have been highly familiar with because he was involved in the Central States promotion for all those years. The rest of the program is almost, almost reminiscent of a Jack Pfeffer program from like the late 60s, or from the mid-60s. It, it, the flavor of the garish hyperbole of that era in wrestling kind of translated with those old timers from the 40s and 50s bobby bruns makes good his promise to buffalo wrestling fans when bobby bruns took over the promotion reigns in buffalo he promised to make buffalo the wrestling capital of the world again by bringing the greatest wrestlers of the world here he is proving that he keeps his word as he brings in names like gallagher brothers moose cholak antonino rocca 
Johnny Powers, Hans Schmidt, and many more. Doesn't seem like there's that many more. But all right, that was, uh, we'll see what else we can <laughs> find out about that. Way, Raka, after he left the Northeast and fell out and was moved out for Bruno by Vince Sr., he went to the Carolinas and worked for Jim Crockett Sr. when they were trying to run opposition into some of Vince's territory. Past that, I know he worked at least shortly for the Sheik in Detroit. But where else did he ever... He was not even working full-time in wrestling during this time period, was he? Not that I'm aware of. And again, maybe this is something I need to take a deeper dive in. He may have showed up on a Detroit show here and there. I know eventually in the 70s, I think he was down in Puerto Rico at the very end before he died. Yeah. But, you know, after... And, and, and did TV commentary in the mid-70s with yeah. Vince Jr. for Vince Sr. when they made up. But uh, this had to be a favor for Bobby Bruns. Well, we'll see what else we can find out about this, because Bobby Bruns, of course, uh, a lot of talk in the last few years of the Observer Hall of Fame. He is the guy credited with, I guess, discovering Ricky Dozan or developing Ricky Dozan and because of that, Japanese wrestling. Yeah, well, he booked the first uh, American wrestling tour into Japan, including Mike and Ben Sharp, the Sharp brothers, and they set the, the, the habit, the pattern of... Uh, native Japanese wrestlers beating up big evil Americans. Um, but he didn't really discover Ricky Dozan because he wasn't anything to discover. He was a sumo wrestler. Yes, but he developed Ricky Dozan to be an attraction in pro wrestling as the native hero. And that was, then that was successful. So you don't really discover someone like that as much as develop them. But I agree with you. All right, Jim, this may be our last program today. The first event, Silento Rodriguez versus Gentleman Ed Sharp. All right. The second event, Jack O'Reilly versus Pretty Boy Collins. One fall, 15 minutes. Okay. The semifinal event, one fall, 20-minute time limit, Gentleman Ed Sharp and tough Tony Morelli versus Silento Rodriguez and Alex Perez. Oh. The first main event has a stipulation I can't reveal. Eh, it doesn't yeah. matter. For the World Judo Championship, the stipulation of the match is that the only way a fall can be won is by one man or the other being rendered unconscious, or <laughs> if the other man concedes defeat. That's how they do it in judo. <laughs> Two out of three falls, one hour time limit. Jesus Christ. Gene LaBelle, the champion, versus Ricky Romero. Okay. And the second main event of a double main event card. Two out of three falls, one hour time limit. Nick Roberts versus Silent Joe Hamilton. Okay. Very, very odd to have Silent Joe and Salento <laughs> on the same. <laughs> well... It is weird. Salento Rodriguez obviously was the noted journeyman babyface who was deaf and couldn't hear. And he got audience participation in his matches because they would jump up and down and wave and yell and point if somebody was sneaking up behind him because he couldn't hear it or whatever. Um, no idea who the guys in the second match are. Um, they brought a couple guys back in a tag, and really the thing that made me perk up there was Alex Perez, because that meant that it was either going to be in the South for Nick or in the Southwest states like Texas. And then when you mention Gene LaBelle, that makes you automatically go to Los Angeles, but this was back in the days when LaBelle was probably trying to wrestle more often than not, because Ricky Romero would bring us back to Texas, and then... Nick Roberts, being Baby Doll's father and not only a top wrestler in Texas, but the promoter in Amarillo and Lubbock in the 80s at least, and Joe Hamilton, Jody Hamilton, before he became one of the assassins, uh, after he main evented the, as the youngest guy to ever main event Madison Square Garden. Um... Salento had to be real young. I would see him uh, doing jobs on Tennessee TV in, in the early 70s. 
but he was young there because LaBelle wouldn't have been traveling past the early 60s. Ricky Romero still in his prime. Nick Roberts still in the ring. We are either in Amarillo or Lubbock, Texas, or some goddamn hoo-ha place in New Mexico. And I'm just going to take a swing and a stab at the year as being 1962. This program, Jim, the sports arena, Tri-State Fairground, Amarillo, Texas. Okay. Thursday, April 28th, 1960. Ah! Two years off. Son of a bitch. Silent Joe Hamilton, master of the rolling cradles, sometimes called the rocking chair split, here tonight. Girls, girls, girls. Lorraine Johnson and Laura Martinez, here Thursday, May 12th. By the way, was Lorraine Johnson not later on married to Nick Roberts and begat Baby Doll? That That's was right. Baby Doll's mom, right? Yeah. The mighty mites of the mat. The midget wrestlers Lord Littlebrook, Cowboy Bradley, Ball Brummel, and, <laughs> and Tiny Rowe, coming May 26th. Coming soon, brutal and vicious Japanese star, Kinji Shibuya. The biggest and most vicious Japanese wrestler in the world today. The sixth ranking heavyweight wrestler in the world, six feet tall, 245, coming soon. Also here. Who was booking the midgets back then? They got booked out of Montreal in the days of Sky Low Low, and, and a lot of them were French Canadian. And then Littlebrook came over and, and moved the midget booking town to St. Joseph, Missouri. Littlebrook's on the show, so I don't know. But I mean, well, Littlebrook's originally from England for real. He wasn't a fake English person. Uh, but they, I think the midgets until that were booked out of Montreal. Do you think Lord Littlebrook is the greatest midget wrestler name? Um, Sky Low Low or Fuzzy Cupid. Either one has to be the greatest. And they were the pioneers, so give them the credit. Fuzzy Cupid over Little Beaver? Well, <laughs> Every once in a while, I'll take a fuzzy Cupid over a little beaver, but it just depends on the way I'm feeling. Attention wrestling fans, something new has come to KFDA-TV Channel 10 every Sunday from 10 p.m. till 12.30 p.m. Excuse me, from 12 p.m. till 12.30 p.m. Our wrestling promoter, Doc Sarpolis, has a TV sports show entitled Ringside with the Wrestlers. Featured every Sunday will be special guests from the wrestling world informal interviews with wrestling fans, and a general rundown on all sports of major interest, plus other features. Sitting in with Doc each Sunday will be wrestler referee Tommy Phelps and Warren Anderson, one of the outstanding TV announcers of the Panhandle area. Better known as... Uh, that's, the that's the whole sentence. Better known as the Plainsman. And from week to week, <laughs> there'll be many surprises in store for the viewers. So make it a regular Sunday afternoon date to watch Ringside with the Wrestlers with Doc Sarpolis as your host, 12 to 12.30 p.m. And that was obviously in addition to whatever their local wrestling program was. But can you imagine? I would love to have seen that local television in black and white in the studio in Amarillo, Texas in 1960 with the wrestling promoter, one of the sports guys from the station, and a bunch of fucking wrestlers. Good God, that could have been local television at its best and most exciting. A bunch of local wrestlers, Dory Funk Sr. I mean, can you yes. imagine that on local to hero? Speaking of which, Funk fined $100 and suspended in Amarillo. The State Athletic Commission has fined Dory Funk $100 and suspended him indefinitely in Amarillo for the attack upon the world's heavyweight champion Pat O'Connor last Thursday night. Funk has already taken action against the state commission, and the commission has been ordered a date in Travis County, Austin, Texas, for a hearing, so that Funk can give his side of the story. For the $100 fine <laughs> that's suspended in Amarillo. Would that ever happen as a shoot, where you're doing something, you know, like, just to use this example, Dory Funk Sr., Dory Funk, there was no junior at the time, Dory, uh, as far as wrestling fans do, Dory Funk attacks the world champion to build up to a match. The athletic commission is not smart or not into it or just doesn't like you says, you're suspended. You're not supposed to do that. Yes. Yes, that has happened. And, and 
it happened a lot in the days, uh, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, places like Amarillo. In a lot of cases, though, now, to be fair, uh, Scott Teal's history of Amarillo indicates that Dory had friendly politicians and or police that would probably participate in shit. But there's always cases of the athletic commission and the promoter or wrestler getting on opposite sides of each other. The, the promoter here in Louisville in the 40s had a public spat back and forth with the commission over a date to run a wrestling show the night before the Kentucky Derby when the athletic commission had cleared a boxing show instead of a rest instead of his wrestling show. And, or there was that when they had the Mark, he wasn't even a Mark. He wasn't a wrestling fan. A athletic commissioner in most cases was a political appointment. When you got a new governor, he'd put friends on the, it'd make the athletic commission or on this board or whatever the fuck. And we got Fred Lampson in the early eighties. And he's the one that complained the first time he saw a battle royal because the rules of wrestling say if you throw a guy over the top rope, you're disqualified. So the 20-man battle royal would have 19 winners because the guy got thrown over the top rope. And then they did an angle. The sheep herders jumped Thomas Marlin, the referee, and beat him up. In the process of doing this angle, they were going to come back the next week with a loser-leave town match because the sheep herders were leaving. Well, that's what fucking... Lampson saw that and legitimately fined Jonathan Boyd $250 for attacking the referee and suspended him until he paid it. So Jerry Jarrett had to pay $250 to the state of Kentucky to get Jonathan Boyd reinstated so he could come back the next week and lose a loser leave town match and never come back again. But if, 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 many times the commission people were either in on it with the promoter or conversely, completely not smart about anything. And they would treat it like a shoot at inopportune times. Well, one final note from this program. Title explanations. World's heavyweight champion, Pat O'Connor, Wellington, New Zealand. World junior heavyweight champion, Dory Funk. Dory Funk defeated Iron Mike in Amarillo, June 25th, 1959. He is recognized in Texas and Alaska. <laughs> North American champion. The title has been declared vacant by the State Athletic Commission until a tournament can be held to decide a new champion. And finally, the World Tag Team Champions, Alex Perez and the Mighty Ortega. They defeated Dory Funk and Dick Hutton, Amarillo, March 10th, 1960. You know, and, and that's the thing also is that uh, Iron Mike DiBiase, Ted's father, was at one point legitimately recognized as the world junior heavyweight champion. And, but at the same time, the, he had ties to Texas. So Dory Sr., as you mentioned, it wasn't no senior at that point, but Dory Sr. was able to get a win over him in his hometown and therefore be recognized there as the world junior heavyweight champion, even though nobody else did. Well, Texas and Alaska. But you could do that shit back then, and the people in Amarillo didn't give a fuck about who was wrestling in Oregon. They thought Dory Funk was the toughest man in the world. And I bet you a lot of modern fans are going to, well, junior heavyweight, Dory Sr., was he 200 pounds until he got old and fleshed out a little bit? I mean, from the pictures I've seen, that's what it looks like, yeah. Maybe. You know, maybe, yeah. But And, and he was... A, through the fact that he was a pretty fucking salty old bastard, but he was able to convince the people with the chain matches and the Texas death matches and the fucking blood and the angles and, and beating the shit out of people on the street that he was the toughest man in Amarillo, Texas in the 19 fucking fifties. And you have to think there was some competition in a cow town like that, right? It was still the wild west. and. People believed him. That's why I remember Terry told a story when he and Dory were little kids and they went in a restaurant and they're eating with their mom and dad. And this guy comes up to Dory and tells him wrestling's all fake and bullshit. And Terry said, and my father just stood up and beat the ever loving shit out of that guy right in that restaurant <laughs> in front of his family. 
And he got away with it, too, because he was Dory Funk. And that's that's how he got respect in Amarillo for the wrestling business. Was it tougher to be a wrestler in the era of kayfabe in a big city or a small city? In a small city. Because think about it, when I can tell you from personal experience that when we went to Louisiana to work in Mid-South Wrestling, if we were in Houston, just on the street, yeah, you know, people would see, but eh, you know, and we didn't, we weren't that frequent visitors, but still, huge TV ratings, but a tremendous sized city. And chances are that even if there are two or 300,000 people watching wrestling in a city of a million and a half or whatever it was, the more people you see, more people ain't going to know you. But if you went to Lafayette, Louisiana, or Lake Charles, or Alexandria, or Monroe, or even Baton Rouge, New Orleans, if you were JYD, um, Jackson, Mississippi, there you're on fucking TV and almost everybody in town is watching it and you're going to get recognized more often than not. And if you're a heel, that means somebody's going to fuck with you. So it was easier in those days being in a big city than being in a smaller city because you could kind of get lost. 